The World Beyond the Headlines lecture series is a collaborative project of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies and the International House Global Voices Program. Our nationally recognized programming is made possible with support from listeners like you. Secure the future of World Beyond the Headlines programming by making your gift online at alumniservices.uchicago.edu slash giving. Please specify World Beyond the Headlines as the area of giving. The World Beyond the Headlines lecture series is supported by the McCormick Foundation, the Norman Wade Harris Fund, and generous contributions from listeners like you. Tonight's speaker is Professor Juan Ricardo Cole, the Richard P. Mitchell Collegiate Professor of History at the University of Michigan. I've known uh, Juan for nearly 30 years, and having met him in Los Angeles uh, when I was a freshman college student at Berkeley and he was a graduate student at uh, UCLA, he may not remember this, but he very generously gave me much needed encouragement and extremely sound advice for my academic career. Uh, and I was already a starstruck admirer of his, having read an article by him entitled Problems of Chronology in Baha'u'llah's Tablet of Wisdom, Lohe Hikmat. Uh, it became clear as I became more and more familiar with his work that the breadth of his interests and expertise is truly astonishing. He has published translations of Persian poetry, theological disquisitions, such as the miracles and metaphors of Mirza Abul Faz Golpaigani at Durrar al Bahia, of the Arabic writings of Khalil Gibran, including his novel Broken Wings, Al Ajniha al Mutakassira. He has continued to publish seminal studies of the Baha'i and Babi religions, such as his 1998 Columbia University Press book, Modernity in the Millennium The Genesis of the Baha'i Faith in 19th Century Iran, and on Shiism such as his 1988 University of California press book, Roots of North Indian Shiism in Iran and Iraq, and his 2002 study, Sacred Space and Holy War, The Politics, Culture, and History of Shiite Islam. His works on colonialism and anti-colonialism, such as Colonialism and Revolution in the Middle East, Social and Cultural Origins of Egypt's Orabi Movement, and his Napoleon's Egypt Invading the Middle East, which is a more recent Macmillan Palgrave publication from 2007. In addition to 16 books, he has published three or four scores of articles on topics just as varied as the above, including studies of gender, identity, and ethnicity in Safavid painting, printing an urban Islam in the Mediterranean world, the mysticism of Sheikh Ahmad al Asai, Sheikh Rais, the Qajar official, Orientalism, and the decline of Grand Ayatollah Sistani's influence in post-invasion Iraq. Many may know Professor Cole from his blog, Informed Comment, which was started, I believe, shortly after the invasion in 2003 of Iraq. And he has proved an extremely well-informed and consistently insightful commentator on the political and military scenes in the US and in the Middle East. In fact, those of us who followed his blog would often be astounded at how quickly after a news story broke, Juan would have not only mentioned it on his blog, but dissected and analyzed and gone well beyond the news story, uh, to the extent that some of us, at least I, began to worry if he ever slept or if his hands were going to fall off from typing so much. But they haven't, uh, much to our uh, joy. And I must say that my esteem for television programs such as PBS's NewsHour or ABC's Nightline and Charlie Rose uh, never flags when I see that they have invited Juan Cole for his views and analysis because I know how well and widely he is respected in the academic world. He will speak tonight on challenges for the new administration in Iraq and Afghanistan and uh, I will leave you with a piece of wisdom from uh, the Shahnameh of Ferdowsi, an epic poem of the Iranian or Persian nation completed just about 1,000 years ago in 2010, will be the 1,000 year anniversary of it. Uh, And this particular set of advice comes um, uh, from the mouth of father kings passing on wisdom to their Uh, princely sons. Uh, In case you're not familiar with it, the Shahnameh chronicles the saga of the Iranian nation from the dawn of history to the fall of the Sasanian Empire and the conquering Arab armies in the 7th century. 
Its most heroic champion comes from Sistan, a region now in Afghanistan, so it's not without uh, pertinence to tonight's topics. But when the Sasanian king Hormozd, son of Shapur, sat on the throne, he was blessed by a benediction and advised to move wisely and deliberately as follows. Zirahe khirad hich gune matab, pashimani arad delatra shetab. Never turn your head in the least from wisdom. Haste and ill consideration bring your heart regret. And Ferdowsi goes on to say, Mazan rai joz ba khirad mand mard, Take no counsel except with a wise man. And I believe that Ferdowsi, were he here with us, would certainly have included Professor Cole in that category. So I am quite honored to uh, present to you Professor Cole to speak on challenges for the new administration in Iraq and Afghanistan. Please join me in welcoming him. Well, thank you all for coming out uh, this evening. Uh, it is um, a great pleasure and honor to, uh, to visit uh, Chicago and to address you. Uh, now it's, of course, uh, we're all looking for friends of Bear, so uh, maybe we'll make some good contacts while we're here. Uh, let me just see if this uh, thing is working. Yes, it is. Good. So I want to talk tonight about what President-elect Obama has said he will do with regard to Iraq and Afghanistan. And then I want to talk a little bit uh, about what I see as the challenges that he might face in accomplishing uh, those stated goals. He um, has fairly consistently called for a relatively rapid withdrawal of US troops from Iraq. Uh, Obama, of course, opposed the war when it happened. Uh, he was uh, still uh, uh, in Springfield then, uh, and uh, so wasn't in a position to vote against it in Congress uh, or in the Senate. Uh, but uh, in the course of the campaign, he made it clear that Iraq is the bad war. Uh, and I think there is actually a moral overtone uh, to this stance on Iraq. That is to say, one of the things he's saying is that the Iraq war was illegitimate. Uh, of course, the United Nations Charter foresees only two uh, reasons for going to war. Uh, one is if a country has been attacked, then of course it may immediately defend itself. But if it hasn't been attacked, uh, launching a war is illegal in international law. Um, and was made illegal in the aftermath of World War II because the Nazis had given war a bad name. Uh, and uh, th the other way that a war could be launched legitimately is if the United Nations Security Council authorized it. So, for instance, you have a frankly genocidal regime. The world community decides it needs to be removed. That could happen. And there is, of course, a genocide convention that foresees such a thing. Um, and, and, and the Bush administration attempted to make a case for both of those conditions. That is to say, they hinted around very heavily that uh, Osama bin Laden and uh, Saddam Hussein slept in the same bed every night, uh, and that somehow September 11th derived from Iraq. Whereas this was not true. Uh, it is a, an outrageous lie. Uh, and uh, all of the evidence that has emerged shows very clearly that Iraq was uninvolved, uh, that there was no operational uh, contact between uh, Iraq and al-Qaeda. Um, but the reason for making those allegations had been that then you could say, well, Iraq somehow was involved in an attack on the United States, and then a war against it would be legitimate. Uh, the other... Uh, the sort of charge of genocide that Saddam killed his own people with, with poison gas and so forth was also invoked. But unfortunately for the Bush administration, the mechanism that the United uh, Nations Charter envisages for launching a war in such instances and removing a, uh, a criminal regime uh, does require that the UN Security Council pass a resolution calling for the war, which it did not. 
and actually declined to do so. Uh, and so the Bush administration was in this awkward and I think untenable position of pursuing a war um, uh, which it said it was pursuing based on United Nations Security Council de resolutions uh, condemning Iraq, um, but in the absence of a UNSC call for a war. Uh, this is sort of, um, what is it, um, you know, upholding the Security Council against its will or something. Uh, and uh, so I think uh, neither condition was met for the war, and I think what President-elect Obama uh, meant when he called Iraq uh, uh, the wrong war uh, was that it was illegitimate in, in the law. And of course, an international treaty like the UN Charter, which the United States has signed, becomes in some ways part of US law. So it was illegal in, in US law to launch this war. Uh, and um, on the other hand, he contrasts Iraq with uh, Afghanistan, which he sees as the good war, as the right war, legitimate. So in fact, there was uh, a NATO uh, declaration of war on Afghanistan. Uh, it was the only time that, that Article 5 of the uh, NATO charter was invoked. Article 5 says that an attack on one NATO country is an attack on all. So it's, 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 it's an invoking of uh, collective security. And uh, ironically, although NATO had been formed to contain the Soviet Union, uh, 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 Article 5 never was invoked with regard to any communist country uh, and ultimately was, was invoked against uh, the uh, Taliban Emirate of Afghanistan. Um, and there was also a UN Security Council resolution uh, the, the import of which was that if a state actively harbors terrorists who have committed a massive act of terrorism, then the UNSC really doesn't care what happens to that state. Uh, so uh, it wasn't exactly a, a declaration of war, but it, it was an authorization really for the United States and NATO to take care of business. So there is a, a legal basis for the war in Afghanistan. And moreover, Obama says, well, you know, we were attacked from Afghanistan. The Al-Qaeda was based there. The Taliban were in cahoots with the Al-Qaeda. Uh, and that was the threat to us. We weren't threatened by Iraq. Uh, we took our eyes off the ball and di di diverted enormous amounts of resources, uh, uh, several hundreds of billions of dollars, uh, lives lost, and so forth, to a fruitless and uh, unnecessary and illegal war in Iraq while uh, allowing Afghanistan to uh, gradually deteriorate into chaos uh, and further violence and resurgent Taliban, resurgent Al-Qaeda. Uh, and so it's a, it is a morality play in a way. It is, uh, it is a, a story of fecklessness. It's a story of, uh, of lack of follow through on the Bush administration's part of perhaps of, of greed uh, overcoming uh, one's best instinct. You know, it's very much like the Aesop's fable about the dog with the piece of meat in its mouth who is over a bridge and sees the, uh, the meat reflected larger in the water below and lets go of the, the meat he has in order to grab for the bigger illusory meat and loses both. Uh, and so that's really, I think, the kind of moral story that Obama is telling about Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, unlike uh, Bush and, uh, and McCain, Obama does not envisage long-term bases in Iraq. Uh, so, um, you know, the Republican Party spokesman uh, and leaders tended to see Iraq, they, they, they put, tried to put Iraq in the same frame as Japan and South Korea. So, you know, we still have bases in Okinawa, we still have bases in, in South Korea all these years later. Uh, and uh, so they, uh, they, they thought Iraq would likely be in a similar position. And they seemed to have it in mind that, well, you know, Japan had been an enemy, we conquered it, turned it into a friend, and then kept bases there. So we'll do the same thing to Iraq. Um, but of course, uh, 
uh, Obama opposes this idea of long-term bases, and I think quite rightly so. And I would say this is me speaking and not Obama, because I don't think he really explains it. But uh, I would say that uh, Iraq is not actually very much like Japan, uh, and even less like South Korea. Uh, that uh, one of the ways that the US was able to stay in Japan after uh, uh, the conquest was that the emperor decided to keep the US around. He had enormous moral authority. Uh, the Iraq has no equivalent of the emperor, but to the extent that he plays some kind of role uh, in moral authority, it would be Grand Ayatollah Sistani, uh, who was the equivalent. And Sistani, the spiritual leader of the majority Shiite community in Iraq, uh, uh, from the very beginning, from April of 2003, talked about the necessity, ultimately, of expelling the invaders. So that doesn't sound very much like what the emperor was saying in 1950. Uh, and then uh, there was that little thing that the Japanese kept the Americans around, I think, largely because they were more afraid of the Soviets and the communist Chinese, especially after 1949. And, um, and so being, you know, having an American security umbrella uh, was desirable because they had powerful enemies that they were afraid of nearby with a different economic and, and ideological system uh, and um, uh, with grudges against the Japanese. Uh, and Iraq is not like that either. There's nobody in the region that the Iraqis are afraid of. The majority of the Iraqis are afraid of. The Kurds and the Shiites are allied with Iran and this is something that Washington speak has never been able to admit to itself. So in Washington, Washington politicians are always talking about the need to exclude Iranian influence from Iraq. And it's odd, because the United States invaded Iraq, overthrew a Sunni-dominated government, and presided over the installation in Baghdad of the Supreme Council for Islamic Revolution in Iraq, which was founded by Ayatollah Khomeini. I mean, even the name of the organization should give you a hint. Uh, and so then for the Americans having installed, uh, more or less, those parties, the, uh, the, the Islamic Missionary Party, the Dawah Party, and the Supreme Council for Islamic Revolution in Iraq uh, in Baghdad, who were close to the Ayatollahs in Tehran, to turn around and say, well, it's very important that Iran not fall under Iranian influence that Iraq not fall under Iranian influence is, is, is bizarre. Um, and, you know, I, I, it, it's, it's sort of like expressing th the, the hope that the Pope won't be influential in Ireland. Um, and um, uh, so Obama recognizes the uh, lack of feasibility with regard to trying to keep bases in Iraq. And I, th I think they would be an irritant, and there would be trouble about it if it, if, if it was attempted. Uh, and, and then the Republicans uh, on the other side would keep throwing up with this possibility, well, if the United States withdraws from Iraq, what if al-Qaeda takes it over? And um, Dick Cheney uh, talked about al-Qaeda taking over the Sunni Arab parts of Iraq and using it as a base to attack the United States. And then John McCain actually speculated that al-Qaeda might take over all of Iraq were the United States to leave. And I think uh, Obama uh, rightly dismisses these possibilities and says, well, you know, if, if al-Qaeda did become powerful in some part of Iraq, so we would bomb it. Uh, we don't need to keep 160,000 troops there for this contingency. But I, I think what he recognizes is that the hyperbole coming from Cheney and McCain is implausible on the face of it. Al-Qaeda, first of all, is there really any Al-Qaeda in Iraq? I mean, how do you do define Al-Qaeda? I define it as, some, as, as a group of people that have given fealty to Osama bin Laden and been given missions to carry out by him. There are two kinds of missions, suicide missions and ones that you survive. So, of course, there are two kinds of al-Qaeda operatives, short-lived ones and long-lived ones. <laughs> well, are there really very many people in Iraq who have pledged fealty to Osama bin Laden and been given missions by him? How would they have found him 
to be given the missions. Uh, so there, are, there, there was a group for a while that declared itself Al-Qaeda in Mesopotamia. Uh, but this uh, shouldn't be taken very seriously. There was no command and control involvement. It would be like someone announcing, I'm scary, be afraid of me. Uh, that's what it meant to be Al-Qaeda in Mesopotamia. Uh, and it was a Jordanian group, not a, not a Saudi group, and so forth. So first of all, I question the, the, the diction of Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And I think it's a, it's a piece of propaganda. Uh, I don't think there's really anything like that. There's, there's now a group that calls itself the Islamic State of Iraq, uh, which um, uh, is, th they're radical fundamentalists who are vigilantes and commit vi guerrilla violence. But, you know, not every radical fundamentalist that is a vigilante and commits violence is ipso facto al-Qaeda. Um, and... Um, and the idea that this group, the Islamic State of Iraq, if that's what Cheney and McCain are talking about, could take over Iraq is just bizarre. I'm sorry to keep using this word, but I have been traumatized by the last eight years. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's like Alice through the looking glass. Uh, Iraq is a majority Shiite country with a majority Shiite army that increasingly is effective and has tanks and uh, armored vehicles and guns. And it would allow uh, the Islamic State of Iraq, this small Sunni Arab guerrilla movement, uh, hiding out in uh, the wastelands of the, uh, uh, around Fallujah and, and, so, and Haditha and so forth. They would allow them to take over Iraq. Why? And then the Kurds, who are another 20% of the population, Largely um, secular-minded people. Jalal Talabani um, is a member of the Socialist International. I thought it was ironic that uh, Bush and McCain and so forth keep running over and uh, and uh, hugging T Talabani and praising him uh, as their ally, and uh, he's a socialist. Um, but in any case, they don't like the the radical fundamentalists either. So it's not plausible that, that al-Qaeda would take over Iraq. Now, it could be argued that, well, you know, the Ba'ath Party was Sunni-dominated, uh, and it took over Iraq. But actually, uh, Amatsia Baram of Haifa University has shown that 50% of the Ba'ath mid-level and lower-level officials were Shiite. Uh, and the Ba'ath Party was a secular Arab nationalist party, which could bring in Shiites uh, who might prefer to emphasize the Arab and national part of their identity rather than the, uh, the religious part. But Al-Qaeda is not like that. I guarantee you, you can take it from me. I stand by it. There are no Shiite Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda is all about killing Shiites wherever you find them. And it has succeeded in killing a fair number. Uh, the Hazara were massacred in Afghanistan, who are Shiite, by the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Uh, and uh, there have been large numbers of Shiites assassinated in Pakistan by groups uh, Al-Qaeda allied, at least. Uh, and um, so Ayman al-Zawahiri is a radical Sunni. Uh, 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 Osama bin Laden, it's not clear to me exactly what he is. Because uh, his family is originally from Yemen, so he might well be a Shafi'i. But whatever they are, they're very anti-Shiite. And so it's not plausible that, you know, unlike the Ba'ath, Al-Qaeda couldn't get a pool, a, a recruitment pool of, of Iraqi Shia who would join in with them, uh, unlike the Ba'ath. So um, uh, this idea that McCain put forward that if the United States leaves Iraq, the uh, Al-Qaeda will take it over and use it as a base to attack the United States. They often said, again, as if the, it, Iraq had attacked the United States once, uh, uh, is, is, not, is not plausible. Uh, and so I think Obama is right about the base issue and about uh, the ability of the United States to deal with whatever threat exists from radical fundamentalist Sunnis in uh, Iraq by other means than a military occupation of the whole country. With regard to Afghanistan, um, Obama, as I said from the, from the beginning of his campaign, identified it as the good war and argued that it was underfunded and understaffed uh, and that needed more troops. 
And um, therefore, he was arguing that uh, 10,000 more troops should be sent. Uh, actually, 10,000 more troops were sent. So, uh, 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 but but he wants he wants to up the number of troops. And by the way, the military commanders like General David Petraeus agree that there need to be more troops in Afghanistan. So Obama's position on this is not out of sync with the uh, the military command. He pledged last summer, uh, in a major foreign policy speech, a billion dollars in civilian aid for Afghanistan, because everybody recognizes the situation in Afghanistan uh, cannot be resolved solely by more troops or by more military action. This is a crushingly poor country. I mean, really, fourth world country. Uh, the, its um, infrastructure has been damaged by 30 years of war. Uh, Americans don't remember, but back in the Reagan era, we uh, spent uh, many billions of dollars to help destroy it in the course of getting the Soviets out of it by backing uh, hardline fundamentalist radical Sunni terrorists, um, which at the time we thought that was a good idea, uh, and uh, some of whom went on to become al-Qaeda. But lots of things were blown up in Afghanistan, either by the Soviets or by the guerrilla groups that we were funding, and we twisted the Saudis' arms to fund more and so forth. Uh, and so, you know, there are, there are landmines all over the place. Uh, uh, when when the, uh, the Taliban were first overthrown and, and U.S. Uh, um, reporters uh, first got into Afghanistan, I still remember there was an MSNBC crew that rented a house in Kabul and it was a fairly nice house and had you know, survived the violence fairly well, but it did have a hole in the, in the roof. And there was this oddly shaped kitchen table, small table in the kitchen. And they would put you know, dishes on it and so forth. And gradually they realized that it was an unexploded missile. Uh, his nose was sticking into the floor. Uh, and so then they sort of... You know, it's a good metaphor for Afghanistan. There are all the all the country is full of that kind of thing. And there's a famous Iranian film, Kandahar, which shows the Afghans, you know, kind of jumping around on one foot because of all the landmines have blown off people's feet. So this is a crushingly poor country. A billion dollars in in civilian aid is very necessary, but I mean, is a, a drop in the bucket compared to the real needs. Uh, Obama also said, uh, somewhat controversially that uh, he would uh, uh, authorize uh, U.S. airstrikes on al-Qaeda positions inside Pakistan, because there is a, a narrow, uh, rugged borderland between uh, uh, the, um, the kind of administratively controlled areas of Pakistan uh, and those of, of Afghanistan, which is not under control. It, uh, there could make a vague analogy to American Indian reservations, uh, uh, but um, uh, these are uh, rugged mountainous areas which uh, are not really under any governmental uh, authority uh, in, in, you know, on the ground, uh, regardless of what is claimed. And so it is alleged that Arab fighters, volunteers, uh, people that are called al-Qaeda have bases there. And uh, the U.S. was not being given permission by the Pakistani government, uh, understandably enough, I think, to violate Pakistani sovereignty by bombing Pakistan. I mean, it's kind of odd that the U.S. is demanding the right to bomb its allies. Um, and uh, But Obama said that they should. If they got real-time actionable intelligence, top al-Qaeda Leaders are in X place in Waziristan, uh, put, a, put a bomb down on them, regardless of what the Pakistani government should say. And of course, Obama said this, and it's not really that controversial in fact, because what U.S. government wouldn't behave that way? Uh, and, and it gradually became Bush administration policy. There's an interesting way in which there's been a, an accommodation of Bush to Obama political stances over time. Uh, but I think what was remarkable was that Obama said it. And you don't s ordinarily in diplomatic relations, you don't like announce that you will bomb your allies. Uh, and uh, the Pakistani public did not like this. In fact, you, you read those newspaper articles about how the people of the Middle East are also very happy that about Obama was elected. In Pakistan, not so much. Uh, and. Um, 
And then he also recently has been, his, his campaign at least, has been talking about uh, pursuing negotiations with Iran with regard to Iranian influence, uh, possibly in calming down uh, Afghanistan, uh, as well as with Pakistan and other neighbors, and of, of, of also negotiating with what they're calling reconcilable Taliban. Uh, these are presumably elements of the Taliban that would negotiate a, a settlement, uh, and, and apparently it's being alleged that there are some that wouldn't. Actually, if you know Afghan politics very well, there's no such a thing as irreconcilable. There, it's a it's a segmentary lineage system. It, it, the anthropologists call it. It's, it's, it's you know it's clans. It's feuds among clans. It's feuds between clans. It's feuds w that, that unite clans against other clans. And it's kaleidoscopic. It's always changing. President uh, Hamid Karzai, who's our, the great champion and, and lionized by the uh, by Washington and so forth had a brief alliance with the Taliban in 1996. Mm, some high-ranking members of the Bush administration advocated good relations with the Taliban in, 19, in the mid-1990s, uh, and our ambassador to the United Nations could be instanced, um, who has, as I believe, a University of Chicago connection. So um, the idea that there are reconcilable, irreconcilable, I mean, that, that's probably too much. Um, one, one thing might be mentioned about Afghanistan uh, in addition, uh, which is that the idea that what's needed in Afghanistan is more troops, uh, a bigger military establishment, um, uh, it has implications for the NATO commitment. Now, most people don't realize there are 66,000 American and NATO troops in Afghanistan as we speak. I think the Soviets at their height had 150,000. And as you know, they lost. Um, so uh, 66,000 is quite a lot. And this is not popular in NATO countries. That is to say, if you did a poll of the Italians and the Poles and the Spanish, the Spanish withdrew from Iraq, but they're in Afghanistan, the Australians and so forth, even our neighbors to the north, uh, the Canadians don't want to be in Afghanistan. The public don't want to be. And the governments are there because chapter, uh, Article 5 of the NATO uh, um, Charter was invoked. Uh, but they don't want to be there much longer. And so the Harper administration in Canada has announced that it's getting out in three years, come hell or high water. And a lot of the NATO countries look at Obama not as a peacemaker, but as someone who has yet another war on his mind and, moreover, wants to drag them into it. Uh, and uh, so uh, this could be an irritant in uh, the new administration's relations with some of the NATO countries. Now, uh, uh, this map of Iraq I show you just to situate things uh, is um, uh, showing Iraq divided into three demographic zones. The green in the south is the Shiites, uh, the Shiite Arabs. The uh, white part in the center uh, and west is the Sunni Arabs. And in the north, you have Kurds. Uh, and it's a mixed region, so uh, uh, you also have Arabs, Turkmen, Chaldean Christians, and, and so forth, and, and, and more things. You know, people think they know, if they know Shiite, Sunni, and Kurd, that that encompasses Iraq. But there are lots of religious sects up there and, and small ethnicities uh, that, uh, uh, that actually are locally quite important for politics. Uh, so this map, however, makes it look like it would be easy to divide the place up. And you know, uh, Joe Biden, who may have a big influence on uh, foreign policy, uh, since he was the chair of the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee or co-chair of it uh, when, uh, when the Democrats were not in power in the past 30 years. Um, and uh, he suggested, well, since the Sunnis and the Shiites and the Kurds aren't getting along very well, why not just have a soft partition, separate them? Um, I know Senator Biden slightly. He was kind enough to call me to, uh, uh, to testify at one time before the committee. And um, 
uh, I say it with no disrespect, but, but it wouldn't work, uh, this partition thing. Uh, first of all, this map is, is schematic and wrong. So it doesn't show you the 300,000 Sunnis at Zubair down near Basra. It doesn't show you that Baghdad is mixed. Uh, it doesn't show you there are Shiites in Samarra. And indeed, about half the Turkmen up north near the, in the Kurdish areas are Shiite. And there, there are Kurdish Shiites, the Feilis and Khanakain. So it's, um, uh, it's, it's a mixed up place, you know. The, the younger Iraqis are fairly hooked into world culture, and uh, you know uh, the, the, there are many families that are mixed. The, the, the mother is Shiite and the father is Sunni, or vice versa. So you know what the children call themselves? Sushi. <laughs> so the Sushi are very alarmed at Biden's plan, because what would happen to them? Now, it's sometimes said it's a partition plan. It's not. Biden doesn't advocate making three countries there. This is a loose federal government over three big ethnically-based provinces. But, you know, if you think around the world to the places that have had a loose government over ethnically-based provinces, they are Nigeria, Lebanon, Yugoslavia, Pakistan. Do you see where I'm going with this? It doesn't seem to create a stable situation. Now, one of the big problems with Biden's plan is that nobody in Iraq wants it, uh, except maybe the Kurds. A and even they denounce it in public. So after Biden's plan was announced, the, the Iraqi parliament had a special session in which all 275 elected members of the Iraqi par parliament took turns beating up on poor Joe Biden uh, as an imperialist divider of the eternal, sacred, and, and indivisible Iraqi nation. And you would say, but, but, but they have divided themselves and killed each other. And, but but the, yes, that's how they're behaving. But when they speak, it's of the indivisible Iraqi nation. Uh, and so he was roundly denounced for this plan. And I think also, you know, when Biden put it forward, there was a time... Uh, uh, when the United States still had a great deal of influence in Iraq. Uh, but how would this plan now be implemented? I mean, wouldn't the Iraqi parliament be the body that implemented any such plan? And it has denounced the plan. All the parties in, in parliament have really denounced this plan. Uh, so I, don't, I wouldn't advise Senator Biden or Vice President-elect Biden to pursue this particular uh, um, course of action, and I don't think actually that it would be possible to pursue it because I think if the Obama administration really does want to get out of Iraq in 2010, uh, uh, and, and, and now the new security agreement that's being forged between Washington and Baghdad uh, specifies at the latest 2011, there's not going to be time for such ambitious uh, sort of gerrymandering of Iraq. And events have frankly overtaken the plan because one of the reasons for it would be to avoid massive ethnic cleansing of one or the other. But under the Americans' noses and during, in part during the surge uh, and before it, um, Baghdad has been ethnically cleansed uh, of, of its Sunnis. It was probably about 50-50 Sunni Shiite in 2003. This is a, a capital of the country, 6 million in a country of 27 million. So it's a, it's a big, important place. It's now 75, 80% Shiite. Uh, so um, uh, in fact, uh, I'm going to, I can't show you all my slides because of, of uh, um, time constraints, but I'm going to flip forward uh, and, and show you uh, a slide of how Baghdad has been ethnically cleansed. Just a second. So this uh, uh, on, on your left is June 2006, which is already a time when many Sunnis had been ethnically cleansed. But you can see the yellow parts are Sutter City. Sutter City is compact, square looking, but it's actually got half the population of the city in it. Uh, but you can see that the, the, the Shiites predominate in Sutter City, in, in, uh, in uh, Kadhimiya in the, in the north. 
uh, but that a lot of the city is mixed, the green parts are mixed, and then there are Sunni uh, areas uh, uh, in the center of the city and so forth. By November of 2007, this is based on Pentagon statistics, you can see that the yellow has just washed over the entire city, and there are little enclaves of Sunnis in the, in the far uh, west, but otherwise uh, uh, it's a Shiite city now. And there was a team at UCLA that's recently done some uh, imaging of ambient light at night from Iraqi cities. And they found that around, uh, uh, around December of 2006, the west part of Baghdad, uh, the pink parts there in that map, uh, went dark. Uh, and uh, this didn't happen in the Shiite east of the city. And it didn't happen any place else in Iraq, in Mosul and Basra and other cities. But uh, it went dark. And what does it mean? It means that th those people don't live there anymore. So even though it's showing them pink, the, the population density is much less. And where are they? They're in, uh, uh, in the Iraqi north, or there are uh, a million of them apparently in Syria. Uh, uh, I would estimate about 200,000 in Jordan, 50,000 in Lebanon, 50,000 in Egypt, 40,000 in Sweden. 6,000 here. Uh, we haven't taken much responsibility for all this. So you, why would you, you know, if you're going to partition Iraq in order to prevent this from happening, well, it already happened. The Shiites won the Battle of Baghdad. And this is another reason for which I think the idea of getting troops out of Iraq is now plausible uh, because, A, since last spring, uh, the Iraqi army has started functioning. Uh, it's gotten better equipped, better trained, better esprit de corps seems to be following orders, and has taken cities like Basra and Amara in the south and, and made its authority stick there. Uh, the Prime Minister, Nouri al-Maliki, has gotten control of the army, apparently, uh, and is deploying it fairly well. So you don't need American infantry in Iraq anymore, I would say, um, or, or mostly you don't need it. And, and this is borne out by statistics, because do you know how many U.S. troops died in hostile action in Iraq in October? Zero. So it, it, if they were being committed as infantry to hand-to-hand -hand combat in these cities and so forth, they would obviously be being killed. They're not. So it means the Iraqi infantry is doing that work now. Um, what the Iraqi military needs from the U.S. is close air support and logistical help. It needs help in moving supplies around and, and, uh, um, and so forth. Uh, and that need probably will also decline in the coming years. So could Obama actually get U.S. troops out by 2010? I think a lot of them, but not probably all. Uh, and could the U.S. military be altogether out of Iraq by then? I think that's a little unlikely, uh, just practically speaking. I think there, there's going to be points at which the Iraqi military gets into combat. Uh, there are still uh, Sunni Arab guerrilla cells uh, blowing things up in Baghdad, uh, in Mosul. Uh, they are going to, to be in combat with them. They may need close air support, uh, and uh, they don't have an air force of their own as yet, and they won't uh, have an effective air force very soon. Uh, because they're just now ordering the equipment, and it takes time to train on it, and so forth. Uh, so um, I think the U.S. military, I mean, certainly the Iraqi military is going to want U.S. military support of that sort. But this could be done uh, with a relatively small U.S. force in Iraq. You, you don't need 160,000 uh, to accomplish these uh, support goals. Uh, but more important, I think the only way you can get out of Iraq militarily is if there is more political compromise and reconciliation. So you know, there's been no leadership on Iraq from the White House. Uh, it has just floated along from one thing to another. Uh, actually, all the time, the six years that uh, Donald Rumsfeld was uh, Secretary of Defense, uh, he had a hands-off attitude towards these sorts of things. So. He, from 2003, you had the looting. He denied that there was any looting in Iraq. He said CNN had a tape of one guy stealing a vase and then looped it over and over again. There was massive looting of Iraq everywhere. 
I mean, this involved tens of thousands of people. 17,000 artifacts were stolen from the Baghdad Museum. Rumsfeld said, well, how many vases could they have? Well, I don't know. They invented the vase. They might have quite a few by now. <laughs> then, uh, then in the summer of 2003, guerrilla war began with the Sunni Arabs, and, and Rumsfeld denied that. He said, it's not a guerrilla war. So a CNN reporter uh, read out to him the Pentagon definition of a, of, of a guerrilla war, which seemed to fit what was going on, and Rumsfeld denied. He said, "No, no, it's not a it's not a guerrilla war." It's sort of you know that scene in Star Wars where um, Obi Wan Kenobi uh, tells the Star Troopers, "These are not the droids you're looking for." That's been the tenor of our government with regard to Iraq uh, since 2003. Then there was no civil war when all those Sunnis were being ethnically cleansed from Baghdad. NBC said that it was going to start calling it a civil war at that point. And, and the Bush administration jumped up and down and said the press is against it. And how dare they call it a civil war? Uh, and uh, they still have a grudge, you know, in the White House to, against NBC for having called it a civil war in Iraq. So it wasn't about the reality on the ground or taking leadership or making things happen. It was about how would you phrase it? You know, what, what euphemism could be found for it? So um, there's been no leadership. And, and I tell you, quite frankly, I have been told by U.S. Uh, government officials uh, who have been in Baghdad that they are very frustrated at the lack of leadership. Uh, the U.S. military is, is, is frustrated at the lack of leadership. Um, the, the decider hasn't very often decided anything. And so if Obama is going to get out of Iraq, one of the things that I would urge on him is to be the diplomat in chief. You know, if you know that the Kurds and the Arabs may end up fighting over the northern oil city of Kirkuk, then why as president wouldn't you hold a meeting with the Kurdish leaders and, and the Arab leaders and come to a settlement on how this will be resolved. Why would you just let it stumble along until some tribesman kills another tribesman and the whole thing erupts into war, which is the kind of thing that happened in Baghdad? Why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you try to fix it beforehand? And if you think that the Sunnis and the Shiites might still fight more with each other because the Americans created what were called awakening councils, these were uh, Sunni guerrillas who went over to the American side and took an American paycheck. Uh, and now they're being pressed on the al-Maliki Shiite government that al-Maliki should pick up the cost of paying them and should integrate them into the Iraqi uh, uh, security forces, which al-Maliki, he thinks they're Baathists and al-Qaeda, and he doesn't want them in his army where they might plot to overthrow him or kill him. Uh, if you know that all of this conflict is likely to happen as you leave between the Sunnis and the Shiites, then again, why don't we hold a few meetings, try to work out a bargain? You know, how did the Lebanese Civil War end, which was fought from 1975 to 1989, and I lived in the first part of it? It didn't just end because they, the, the, the guerrilla groups took territory. It wasn't settled militarily. It was the Saudis brought everybody to this really, really nice convention center in Taif, uh, which is kind of their Palm Springs, and didn't let them leave until they made a grand national bargain. And, and they did, and it worked. You know, the militias in, ba in, in Beirut actually disarmed in the aftermath. Um, does it make Lebanon paradise? No, but it's not in a civil war. Uh, and the same kinds of grand bargains could be worked out if you had leadership in the White House among, among the Iraqi forces. Um, with regard to uh, Afghanistan, it's the same thing. And I think it's very positive that Obama is not only talking about putting more troops there, uh, and I wouldn't actually suggest that more troops is a solution in Afghanistan. Did, did anyone of you ever like see an Afghan interviewed on television, like a Pushtun tribesperson from the south of the country, who said, our big problem in life is we don't have more foreign troops in our villages? And I think there's some real danger of the U.S. Uh, doing what the Soviets did, which was to deeply alienate people by a big troop presence. And there have been these con aerial strikes of, on, on wedding parties, and, and uh, six of them now, uh, which have killed a lot of people. And there's a lot of resentment. 
But uh, the positive things I see in Obama's plan for Afghanistan are, are more that he is talking about civilian aid, not enough, but that is certainly one of the things that needs to be done if this thing is to be resolved, because a lot of the problems there are not ideological. It's not that people like, like the Taliban. It's that they're crushingly poor, uh, and there may be reasons for which they sign up uh, to fight alongside them. Uh, and uh, so he has been talking about civilian aid, and then he's talking about negotiating, both with neighbors that the Bush administration wouldn't negotiate with and with uh, Taliban themselves. And figures like Golbin and Hikmet Yar were allies of the United States in, in the 1980s. Personally, I don't like him. I wouldn't want him as an ally, but anyway, he was. And, and in fact, a, a fifth of all CIA money went to him and his group uh, at that time. So the idea that he's completely irreconcilable to the United States is odd because he used to be an ally. He could be again. And one of his main demands, and I heard him talking on Al Jazeera yesterday, is, is a drawdown of troops from Afghanistan. So he wants what the Iraqis are going to get. Um, so uh, in the long and the short of it to conclude is that uh, many of the talking points that President-elect Obama and uh, his running mate Joe Biden put out during the campaign probably have been overtaken by events. Uh, when Obama started talking about a quick withdrawal from Iraq, that was controversial. People didn't know if the Iraqi military would be up to it in the aftermath and so forth, how all hell might break loose. Now you've got an elected Iraqi government demanding that the U.S. be out by 2011. And the Bush administration, which had always resisted such things, actually acquiescing in the demand. Uh, and you've got a, a vastly improved security situation in uh, South Iraq because of the Iraqi army starting to work. And you've got a, a very unfortunate, uh, unfortunately produced improvement of security in Baghdad because you know, the Shiites would have to drive for a while to find a Sunni to kill anymore. And so the daily death tolls have declined enormously. Uh, but in any case, there's much, much more security in the capital than there used to be. So, uh, you know, in a way, Obama's plan for Iraq has become more plausible over the two years that he's been campaigning. It's had nothing much to do with him. Uh, maybe it was foresightful. Biden's plan of soft partition, I, th I think, has become less and less plausible. Uh, and I think the Sunnis and the Shiites don't want to partition uh, and would speak very strongly against it. And I think the Kurds realize that there's uh, danger in them appearing to be too autonomous, that this will upset the Turks and, and also Baghdad and Iran and, and cause them a lot of trouble. Uh, so the, the Kurds are determined to be kind of the Taiwan of the Middle East. It's an independent country. It acts like an independent country. It has all the trappings of an independent country. But you don't say that it's an independent country because it would cause a war. Uh, and so you know, one of the problems with the Biden plan is that it might get too close to an open announcement of uh, a truth that can't be spoken. Uh, so um, I think all of these plans are well and good. Uh, how they're implemented is very important. Uh, but that the chief thing that's needed uh, is, is leadership, diplomacy, and follow through. And it's something we haven't had for quite a while. Thank you. As regards your, you, the, the last comment you made regarding Kurdistan, not merely a case um, that we should uh, pretend that Kurdistan as an independent um, governance that we should just sort of overlook it. Um, that what really would be at issue is that they would be able to negotiate separately with the United States over their oil. Um, and you haven't determined a reason why the United States went through all the trouble that it went through um, to get so deeply into Iraq. So that the Biden plan becomes, uh, if they don't give it up, it's really still pretty frightening. Uh, because it's a projection of what America wants and how America is seeking to get it. And mm -hmm. one way that it could get it, I mean, I speculate, of course, and you would know better, um, is to lop off Kurdistan and be able to deal um, with Kurdistan and allow them access to, allow America access to Kurdish oil yeah. uh, as a prerequisite for a Kurdish state. I, t I take your question. I, I, you know, so far at least, uh, th what is now Kurdistan, the, the three provinces, uh, Soleimaniya, Dohuk, and uh, Erbil, don't have much petroleum. 
Uh, and and to tell you the truth, if that, if Kurdistan stays those three provinces, uh, it's difficult to understand how it can be a viable state. Anyway, it doesn't really have it's landlocked. It doesn't have any resources. It's mountainous and so forth. Uh, so um, uh, the the oil is in Kirkuk, uh, but to tell you the truth, it's not that big a field anymore. It was an old field and it's been drawn down. And so I think on a good day they can do three hundred thousand barrels a day. It's, it's really nothing to write home about. And the Kurds would very much like to incorporate it into Kurdistan because although it's a small, uh, a small export, it's, it's not, I mean, it would be enough to help them uh, with their uh, uh, semi-autonomy. But they've already made an agreement with Iraq that they would get 17 percent of the Kirkuk field proceeds. So there's no way in which, if I take the tenor of your question, uh, a soft partition of Iraq helps the United States if, if it's what it wants is access to development of Iraqi petroleum. Because the fields to be developed, which are very rich and, and black and, <laughs> and, and gooey, are, are in the south. They're in Amara and Kut. Uh, and in fact, if you were an oil major, you wouldn't want a soft partition of Iraq because you would want to be able to sign one contract with the Iraqi Ministry of Petroleum and have it be done. Whereas if it's divided, then you have to sign three if you're dealing in different parts of the country and so forth. So no, I can't. Biden's plan seems to me unconnected to petroleum policy. In fact, the soft partition was opposed by Jerry Bremer, the first U.S. viceroy of Iraq. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and he also opposed uh, a secession of Kurdistan. So I, the Bush administration has been pretty firm about wanting Iraq to stay together as a unity, which is what actually would make sense if you were interested in developing Iraqi petroleum. Uh, so I don't, I don't see it that way. I, I think Biden was genuinely trying to put forward a plan that would reduce violence, uh, and uh, and I think he just got overtaken by events. Uh, you haven't really said much about what you would see as the desirable outcome in Iraq. Uh, or to what end the diplomacy should be directed. So to uh, invite you to elaborate on that, let me suggest as a straw man the idea of resurrecting the tradition of Iraq as really a very cosmopolitan country, that it was more the American invasion and Bremer's policies that created a lot of the sectarian division. But if the United States played a role in guaranteeing security through the elections of a new parliament and provided enough security with Iraqis so that the two million or more refugees could return, and many of them might actually return to Baghdad and undo some of that sectarian cleansing, um, and then see to uh, election of a new parliament that actually would represent most of the people in Iraq, what would you think of that as a desirable outcome, like a, a stable, democratic, cosmopolitan Iraq? Yes. Well, a stable, democratic, cosmopolitan Iraq would be all very nice, but um, unfortunately it doesn't exist. Uh, actually, Iraq is run by sectarian militias, sectarian, ethno-sectarian militias. And the, the likelihood that it will cease to be run by ethno-sectarian militias anytime soon is low. The refugees are not going back. I was doing research in Amman this summer with Iraqi refugees in Jordan. And that was one of my research problems was, you know, why don't they go back? Now the violence is much reduced. You know, in 2000 and uh, summer of 2006, you could have 3,000 civilians Oh, kill, killed a month, and these were the official statistics, which probably a vast undercount. Uh, and now it's four or five hundred, typically, um, a month. So obviously, in any one neighborhood, it's much calmer. And so I thought, well, why don't they go back from Jordan? Because they haven't. I mean, the Iraqi press is full of these uh, sort of hyped stories uh, about people going back, but it's been a few tens of thousands that have gone back, and and actually more have come out during the period that those few tens of thousands have gone in. So uh, it's obviously not a good situation. And so I, I asked the ones in, in Amman, you know, why don't you go back? What's going on? I, can, uh, I, I had dinner with a, a, um, a woman architect who's quite prominent in Iraq. 
she's Shia, her husband is Sunni, uh, and she says, you know, we have no place to go back to. We, we used to live in a mixed neighborhood that's no longer mixed. So if we live in a Shiite neighborhood, uh, the, the Shiite militia will kill my husband because he's Sunni. If we live in a Sunni neighborhood, then, um, then, then I will be killed. Uh, and, and people's terrains, people's neighborhoods have disappeared from them. They have a different social complexion now. For the Sunnis, you know, the Mahdi army, the, the hardline Shiite militia is sitting in their living rooms. Uh, and uh, a fourth of the families in Jordan had had um, children kidnapped. Uh, and whether they got them back or not, if they got them back, they had to spend their life savings to do it. Uh, as soon as they did, they got out of the country. Uh, and if they didn't get them back, then they got out of the country also. Large numbers of them have been threatened by name. You know, if Muhammad Jawad shows his face in Karada again, he's a dead man. So, you know, you'd have to be really... Uh, really confident that Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki and uh, General Ray Odierno had things in hand to go back to a place where you had been personally threatened by people that you knew still lived there and who said you would be dead if you came back. Uh, uh, yes, Mr. Cole. Um, I was hoping that you, if you could address a little bit the feasibility of um, President-elect Barack Obama's um, statement that he would attack um, al-Qaeda in the uh, northwest, wherever in the, in the provinces, or even if he they got a, a you know they got a, a beeper where Osama might be, he'd zero in. If you could talk about the feasibility of this in terms of strategy of the long-term strategy of trying to rebalance the situation in Afghanistan, because obviously it seems to be a short-term uh, tactical necessity because the Bush administration has been doing it. Um, but it seems to me it's just going to end up having boots on the ground in Pakistan, which has has been predicted by one of the Atlantic writers as long ago as two years ago. And so that seems to me to be, just be, you know, not where we really want to go, whether you could talk about the feasibility or the non-feasibility of that and perhaps speak about possibilities of uh, trying to disentangle the Taliban from its major source, which seems to be the ISI in Pakistan. I mean, that's a whole hornet's nest there. And, uh, and you know, through negotiation, if they're our ally, and we have a, hopefully a more favorable government now with the... Um, uh, Prime Minister they have there. Now, if you could talk to that, and, you know, he yeah, wants to negotiate. Yeah. So, because I don't think that's, you know, maybe he was talking up, he wanted to show that he's also willing to be strong to the American people. That was a, a, a promise of him or a statement as a candidate. But as a president, you know, I would think that he would have to think twice before, you know, extending a war further. Thank you. Sure. Well, it's a good question, and it uh, concerns the Pakistan side um, uh, with regard to the Afghanistan situation. The, the it's actually, it seems to me, a lot of, there are a lot of misnomers in all this. And we, now any member of the Pushtun ethnicity uh, who speak an Eastern Iranian language and are largely uh, Sunni Muslims uh, who live in northern Pakistan or southern Afghanistan, any of them that is a, a dissident against their government is now being labeled Taliban. Uh, and uh, it's it's not uh, it's not accurate. You know, the Taliban were uh, seminary students uh, who most of them refugees from the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan who were living in camps in Pakistan, and many of them orphans. Some of them were kind of like the West African child soldiers, uh, and they were a distinct group. I mean, they had a sociological character, and they were backed by the Pakistani military because uh, they, it turned out that they were disciplined and they were honest, they, they didn't engage in graft, they didn't shake people down. You know, they were kind of like Mussolini. They made the trains run on time. But Afghanistan, I don't think, has many trains. But uh, they, they, they did whatever the equivalent was in Afghanistan. And uh, so the, the, it was a way for the Pakistani military to assert I its influence in Afghanistan um, uh, at a time when the old warlords uh, uh, who had fought the Soviets were tearing the country apart with uh, their own internal battles. And also, uh, you know, Pakistan views Afghanistan as what it calls its strategic depth, that Pakistan is very isolated. It's a, it's a, it's a country created for South Asian Muslims, uh, and uh, it has Hindu India on one border and has had several wars with Hindu India over the disputed territory of Kashmir. 
Uh, it has Iran, uh, which is a Shiite country, uh, as another neighbor. So it, it kind of feels isolated, and uh, it feels that Afghanistan should, if at all possible, be a friend. And um, unfortunately for Pakistan, the Northern Alliance, which the United States helped to take Kabul in 2001-2002, uh, is very pro-Indian. And so Pakistan is very unhappy about about the situation in Afghanistan. It feels it's lost its strategic depth. I don't understand the strategic depth business. If the problem is between India and Pakistan, you know their eastern border is what's important. How can you have strategic depth behind you? I don't, I don't get it. I mean, if Indian tanks rolled towards Lahore, you know, it would do no good for Pakistan to have a friend in Afghanistan way over in the north. But uh, that's the way the Pakistani High Command speaks. So likely there are cells in the inter-services intelligence in the Pakistan military that are encouraging Pushtun tribes people that we were calling Taliban to go over and hit things in Afghanistan and make life difficult for the Northern Alliance forces that now control the country. On the other hand, the Pakistani military as we speak has launched a massive military operation against the Pushtun uh, Mamun tribe of uh, Bajawar agency in that no man's land between Afghanistan and, and Pakistan, uh, fighting the Pakistani Taliban, uh, killing large numbers of them and displacing 300,000 people some of them having taken refuge on the Afghanistan side. So it's very confusing that the Pakistani military really is fighting the Taliban and al-Qaeda in Bajawar. But then in South Waziristan recently, they were accused of giving some help to Taliban that went over and blew things up in Afghanistan. So they seem to be playing both sides against the middle. When the Taliban are inconvenient to them, they hit them, and they hit them hard. Uh, when they're convenient to them, then they encourage them. And uh, uh, how the United States can affect all this, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, certainly, the United States military can't subdue the tribal agencies of Pakistan. This is a place as big as Vermont, uh, but rugged like our southwest, like the Rocky Mountains. Uh, and with a population of three and a half million spread very thinly over a wide area. They know that territory like the black back of their hands, and, and we don't. So, you know, it, it, it's just an impossible task. And no, no imperial ruler has ever conquered that area and made it stick. The British never could, uh, and uh, the Pakistani government doesn't control it, and they're there. So this idea of boots on the ground in, in you know, in, in South Waziristan, I mean, it's a flight of fancy. It's, it's impossible. And, and historically speaking, insurgencies very seldom have, have ended through military action. Mostly, they're negotiated to a settlement. And so I would want to find out what do people in Bajawar really want and why are they really fighting with the government and how could you make them happy and, uh, you know, if it didn't cost too much, settle them down. Uh, so I'm hoping that's what Obama will do instead of sending in predators which the Bush administration, as I said, they took this leaf from the Obama book in a way, and they're already sending in predators, and it's causing trouble with us, with, with U.S.-Pakistani relations. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cole. You drew an interesting parallel between the relative success of post-war negotiations in Lebanon and the potential for negotiations in an increasingly sectarian Kirkuk. My question is, now that the Kurds form a large plurality, and that they have engaged in low-level civil conflict, but there really hasn't been a true test of strength between the disparate factions and organizations. What incentives do the Kurds have to sit down and negotiate? So the question is, uh, if we wanted to settle this Kirkuk issue of the, the northern oil city of Kirkuk uh, and the province around it, which is contested between the Kurds on the one hand and the Arabs and Turkmen on the other, uh, that since uh, there's been a vast migration, and the, the Kurds would say a re-immigration. They would say they were kicked right. out of Kirkuk by the Saddam government, and he brought a lot of Arabs in from the south, and that they're now reversing these demographic trends and bringing uh, the Kurds back. I think new Kurds have also come. Uh, but uh, certainly by now there is a majority of Kurds in Kirkuk province. Uh, and were there actually to be a referendum, as was called for in the Constitution, uh, the Kurds would win it. Um, 
personally, I don't think that, that a referendum is the way to settle this problem uh, because, you know, it's a tyranny of the majority. And this is the whole problem with post-2003 Iraq, is they didn't have a James Madison. Uh, in, there was nobody who was sufficiently afraid of a tyranny of the majority. So the, the, the Iraqi parliament is, is, at the moment at least, is a single chamber parliament where you have up and down votes by majority rule. 60% of the country is Shiite. Who do you think wins every single vote? And will win it from now to eternity if things don't change. And how frustrated would you be if you were a Sunni or a parliamentarian who couldn't ever win a vote? Uh, because the Shiites would always out overrule you. So this is a tyranny of the majority. And there's no count. I mean, the president, uh, presidential council tries to be a countervailing force, but I don't think very effectively. And the same thing with Kirkuk then. If you just have a, a straight up and down referendum, then whoever manages to bring in most people wins the referendum. And then it turns into a war in the aftermath. Um, I think Kirkuk could be settled in other ways. I mean, the question is, does it belong to Kurdistan or does it belong as a, as a, as a province of the rest of Iraq? And, um, well, you could imagine partitioning Kirkuk, the province. Take the parts of it that are close to Kirkuk, close to Kurdistan, and have big Kurdish populations. Join them to Kurdistan. Draw a, a line through the middle of, uh, of Kirkuk city. Uh, and uh, then, of course, the Kurds have already agreed to have the oil be shared, and they have a formula for how much they would get. So, I mean, I think you needn't do it that way. You could do it other ways. But it, the, the thing needs to be negotiated to a settlement. Just having a referendum and imposing uh, a, a tyranny of the majority is, is not a good way to go forward. I, I'd like to ask this question bearing in mind that many of us here are future or current teachers and, and you know, possibly future bureaucrats and other sorts of citizens. Um, and, and I hope this isn't too sort of uh, oblique to your purposes here uh, speaking to us, but uh, I think there, there's an optimism. I think not a, not a misplaced optimism that the current administration is not going to be informed by a kind of Islamophobia or, or you know, delusions of a, a class of civilizations. Um, nonetheless, in the... The, the current moment of, of euphoria and, and uh, hopefulness um, that, that we might begin to forget the, um, the, the real interests and the real um, needs and motives of, of people of the Middle East and Muslims and, and you know, people who I could otherwise group but who are not um, generally invisible in American political discourse, don't have much of a presence. And I was wondering if you could offer some advice as a, uh, somebody who's had considerable experience as a public intellectual for how, how we can help to change that in our functions, our various functions as, as teachers and whatnot. Okay, thank you. Should this be the last question? Or? I think uh, we, we had better. Okay. Yes, we want to leave some I, I'm being informed that, I, that this will be the last question. We're gonna, I'm going to sign some books afterwards. I'm sorry about, about that. Um, yeah. I'm, uh, so with regard to um, Islamophobia uh, and the invisibility of certain people in the American political process and so forth. Uh, I mean, there, there's no trick to this. Uh, uh, the, the, the issue is, is getting oneself informed, uh, re reading about uh, the new minorities in the United States. Uh, the Muslim Americans are a major one about which there is a growing uh, academic literature. Uh, being aware of groups that advocate for them. Uh, the, the Council on American Islamic Relations is one, uh, and uh, there are others. Uh, the Arab Institute uh, in Washington, D.C., headed by uh, James Zogby, the uh, Arab American Anti Discrimination Committee, the ADC. Uh, uh, personally, I, I joined the ADC. Uh, um, I'm a mutt, uh, as Obama said he was. Uh, um, uh, who knows? But uh, the things we know about are German and Irish and French and British and, and so forth. But I'm a member of the Arab American Anti-Discrimination Committee. Uh, and I, I think that more people of various ethnicities in this country need to be because uh, it, it's a truism. And I think Churchill pointed it out that a civilization is judged by how it treats its minorities. Uh, so um, I think the, the likelihood is uh, that the rhetoric uh, of this campaign, which I was appalled at and found uh, particularly on the Republican side, uh, to be frankly 
uh, Islamophobic and racist uh, toward Muslims and Arabs, uh, and and you know actually the the Republican faithful in the end chose. Uh, John McCain, who, who who engaged the least of all of them in that rhetoric, uh, until he, he had a moral failure towards the end. But um, uh, uh, that Giuliani and uh, Huckabee and others uh, said things I think that were they said about any other minority in the United States would have been uh, thought completely unacceptable. Uh, and uh, so I, I think that the Muslim American and the Arab American communities have been uh, energized uh, uh, by, by this kind of uh, tactic and by the way in which they've been dragged into uh, the public arena. And I think the rest of us uh, can help uh, the country to go forward and to heal what has been a really nasty uh, campaign in this regard by, uh, by, by just joining and reading and being aware uh, that uh, you know, it's, we, we are a multi-ethnic society, and indeed, uh, the United States is uh, increasingly uh, very much uh, like the world. You know, Bill Clinton said he wanted his cabinet to look like America. Well, I've got news for Bill: you know, America increasingly looks like the world, uh, and that means we have a lot of work to do if we're all to get along. The World Beyond the Headlines Lecture Series is a collaborative project of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies and the International House Global Voices Program. The World Beyond the Headlines Series aims to bring scholars and journalists together to consider international news stories and how these stories are covered. As a listener, you have come to rely on this program for in-depth analysis of major issues facing our country and our world. But we can only continue our nationally recognized coverage with support from you. Secure the future of World Beyond the Headlines programming by making your gift online at alumniservices.uchicago.edu slash giving. Please specify World Beyond the Headlines as the area of giving. The World Beyond the Headlines series is supported by the McCormick Foundation, the Norman Wade Harris Fund, and from generous contributions from listeners like you.